Hello, everyone. Thank you for logging in for today's prep tech talk titled Innovations in Resource Management and Mutual Aid Technology. I'm going to give us about another 30 seconds to give a few more people time to join, and we will begin at that point. Thank you. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with today's prep tech talk on innovations in resource management and mutual aid technology. Thank you for joining us today. If we can go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll just cover a couple of housekeeping type of items. So due to the large attendance at these sorts of webinars, all of the participants are muted for the duration of this session, just to prevent background noise and make everything as smooth as possible. But we still want to engage with you so if you have any questions, we encourage you to use the Q&A functionality within Zoom. You should see that in your toolbar. For any questions that are relevant to this group, um, our panelists that have joined us today will be able to answer those and see those, and it'll be a good way for us to, to connect with you. And we will address as many of those Q&As as possible, and we surface material on our website for NAPSIG Foundation after these events so that you can access that material afterward. And just one final item of notice, so this session is being recorded and the materials will be provided on our website later. We want to proceed to the next slide. I'm really excited about today's agenda and uh, session. So we wanted to cover the objectives that we will be covering today. The first item is learning about FEMA's National Resource Hub and how to gain access and start using that suite of resource management tools. We're excited to uh, show you the progress that's been made and some upcoming items on that. You'll also gain insight into how the National Resource Hub can connect and share data with other incident management systems um, and other third party systems in use today and in the future. We're gonna learn about what is in development to improve existing and innovate with new resource management and mutual aid technology tools and systems. Also, we're heavily focused on standards today, which I'm excited about because of the importance of that. And we will cover some of the importance of that also. But you'll find out what's new in version three of the implementation guide on information sharing standards and how you can apply that guide in your own agency with your technology selections and acquisition processes. Uh, to ensure that you are acquiring interoperable uh, technology that can seamlessly share information. And lastly, you'll gain basic technical knowledge on the latest with the EDXL, that's the Emergency Data Exchange Language, and how it supports building a national and global network of interoperable incident management systems. So with that, we'll proceed. Here is the agenda. We're already in introductions and overview. We'll be covering the National Resource Hub next. Hank Roland will be covering that. We'll be looking at what's coming in the job aid and technical guidance for incident management technology, um, cover the basics on EDXL and why it matters. As noted, the, the standards are important. And then lastly, we'll cover some actions and next steps so that you can engage with what you've seen today. So with that, we'll proceed and I will introduce the great panelists that we have with us today. So as noted, I am Charlotte Abel. I'm a strategic manager here with NAPSIG Foundation. With us today, we also have Hank Rowland. He is the section chief for FEMA's National um, Integration Center. He serves as the chief of the NIMS documents and tools section. And in this role, he manages the NIMS portfolio, which includes the national qualification system, and the National Resource Hub that we'll be covering today. Hank's been with the NIC since 2014, working on various preparedness efforts, including resource typing, NQS, and the NIMS suite of documents. We also have Rebecca Harned. She possesses over 15 years of working in the field of emergency management and currently serves as vice president with Four Arrows Consulting. In this role, she's responsible for providing strategic advisory support to FEMA in the formation of the National Resource Hub and other key initiatives. 
And last but definitely not least, we have Elisa Jones. She is chair of the OASIS Emergency Management Technical Committee and has served in that role since 2004 and is internationally recognized as an expert in emergency interoperability communications via data messaging. She works closely with operational disaster managers through her active membership in the International Association of Emergency Managers at the regional, national, and international level. So very excited about the panelists that we have with us today. Thank you for joining us. Can we proceed to the next slide? So as we engage with this, uh, we wanted to provide you with a brief overview about NAPSIG Foundation. Many of you may already be familiar with us, but for any of you joining us for the first time today, it's nice to know who's presenting to you. So our vision here at NAPSIG Foundation is to have a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome for survivors. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's been around a little over 15 years. Uh, one of our strengths and ways we succeed is through our membership network. So you see here that we have over 20,000 in our member network that include public safety leaders, first responders, and GIS practitioners. And through them, we stay connected with those real world issues and are able to inform next steps and get a good picture across the nation. And our, we're also excited that our board of directors also is comprised of public safety and emergency management industry leaders. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you're, you see a number of organizations that have been pivotal in the establishment and ongoing success of NAPSIG Foundation, and we're grateful to them. We proceed to the next slide. So it, with the vision that we just covered, part of what we always keep in mind is that decision makers and first responders need access to the right actionable information at the right time. Um, how can we make anything that we gather together actionable and useful on the ground? Next slide, please. So how we do it. So this is a collection of different ways that we approach this. So at the bottom tier of this pyramid, you see defining and promulgating consistent best practices. So we do that through national guidelines and standards and other material that's made available on our website, free of charge, of course. Uh, next rung in the tier is fostering regional collaboration through implementation. So we do this through exercises and simulations and also through different pilot projects across the nation with a lot of great stakeholders. Uh, we build capacity in using innovative technology through education and training, just like the webinar today, trying to make that as available, readily accessible and available as possible. And lastly, at the top, transferring knowledge and skills through technical assistance and, and direct interaction with different jurisdictions and agencies across the nation. Next slide, please. Wanted to highlight briefly that you can find some of the material that I was referencing before on our website at napsigfoundation.org to include uh, our resources tab that includes things like guidelines and templates and some of the material we'll provide today we have direct links to, but you'll be able to navigate to it through our website also and also be able to access upcoming events on our website as well. With that, let's proceed to get a look, so I had noted that we have a large member network, but also wanted to highlight the diversity and the spread of uh, the registrants for today's session. So you can see uh, registrants are scattered all across the nation, and we have a good breakdown of uh, different types of organizations and very excited about uh, the, the volume there you see on the top right of local government participation uh, and state government. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to present this material to you. Next slide, please. As we begin to transition into the meat of today's session, um, I'm excited because this connects so well with some of the efforts here at NAPSIG that we've been engaged with over the years. So background on this innovative resource management and mutual aid policy and technology involvement. So our goal with the work that NAPSIG has done in this space is to build from lessons learned in recent incidents and exercises to address some of the most pressing needs and requirements around the fusion of incident management policy, technology, and information sharing, because we recognize that uh, we, hit, we hit barriers on different fronts at different junctures and recognizing um, what needs to be addressed to move forward is important. So we have worked towards this goal through uh, these four different areas 
that you see on the bottom of the screen. So through incident management policy and technology, recognizing uh, the need for it across all hazards and all disciplines. Applying information sharing standards to incident management and mutual aid technology right at the heart of what we're talking about today. Through testing and evaluating interoperability among commonly used incident management and mutual aid technology. So uh, through exercises and things like I highlighted before um, to ensure what we are building toward is functioning as expected. And through intelligence driven resource management and mutual aid planning. And uh, to proceed with where we've been and where we're going, I am going to hand off at this juncture to Rebecca Harned with Four Arrows Consulting, who has been supporting NAPSIG in this, in this space. So over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so I'll just share a really brief uh, history and this is really only the past four years and it certainly has a much earlier genesis, but um, back in 2017, there was an effort undertaken with the stakeholder community to start by defining the information requirements um, for operations involving mutual aid. So what information do leaders and decision makers need to know in order to manage their resources effectively during an incident that requires uh, mutual aid? And so that really served as the foundation to inform some of these other efforts. Um, and then later in 2017, there was the, uh, the certainly not the first, but um, kind of this next generation of national mutual aid technology exercise, also known as NMATE. Um, and that was conducted with a number of different state, uh, local, national organizations uh, and really gave us the first opportunity to baseline the interoperability of common systems used across the country. And then following the 2017 uh, disaster season, should we say, with multiple major hurricanes and wildfires and other events, uh, there was a crisis management technology meeting uh, to really ensure that we captured lessons learned out of those disasters that relate to technology and information sharing in support of mutual aid. And that led to the conduct of a workshop on whole community information sharing. Uh, it was focused around wildfire. I'm sorry, it was focused around hurricane, but also um, flowed in some of the lessons learned from wildfires and other events. And then from there, um, that following uh, a spring, about a year later, uh, there was the first uh, of the National Resource Management Summits conducted, and that really helped to bring together a lot of the major associations across the country working in public safety to understand what our major need areas are in resource management, both, both policy as well as technology. And that helped to inform the, the 2019 uh, National Mutual Aid Technology Exercise or otherwise known as NMATE, and, which is the basis of the Mutual Aid Interoperability Action Plan. Um, from there, uh, which some of you may be a part of, FEMA launched the uh, NIC coordination group and specifically a technology subgroup. Uh, and things like a NIMS technology roles and function study was conducted. And then um, as a part of the partnership with NAPSIG uh, in the process of conducting a resource management maturity study. Um, you, there you go. And which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes and share with you how you're gonna be able to participate in that study as well. So as you can see, there's been a long genesis of efforts that have led us to this point and that have led to um, where we're at today, both in terms of technology as well as the evolution of NAPSIG's guidance, which is really founded upon the standards. Next slide. So these are just uh, some few highlights in terms of these major events and what they mean and what they represent with regards to incident management policy and technology coordination. And this gives you a sense of just how all of these efforts have worked to ensure a national perspective. And when we mean national perspective, we're talking about, you know, from the ground up at that local county state um, NGO level all the way on up, um, you know, nationally, right? And so, you know, that's really been, you know, the foundation of the approach that has been taken for all of these efforts and the cumulative progress over the last several years. 
Next slide. Great. And provided here is just what we're doing is giving you a quick reference uh, sheet, basically, of the supporting resources um, that are referenced kind of throughout today's uh, different briefings so that you'll have be able to refer back to them and click on these different links. And I will mention that um, all the slides, materials, and recording from today's session will be provided to all participants. They will be pub uh, published publicly on the NAPSIG Foundation website, and a notice will go out to you when those are available. So you will have access to all of this coming out of today's session. And with that, um, I am pleased to have the opportunity to hand this over to Hank Rowland uh, with FEMA's National Integration Center. So uh, Hank, over to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, it's great seeing all the, you know, the, um, it's funny you, you mentioned, you know, it's only four years, but it, I mean, it just, it's, it's crazy how much even in just the past, you know, two years, how much things have really accelerated. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today. And I think that, you know, what we're talking about today is really kind of, a, um, you know, it, it is a result of a lot of that, that, you know, that Rebecca was just talking about a lot of those efforts, you know, that have far preceded this. Um, but we are, we are certainly happy to, to be talking about this and having this, uh, you know, excited to have it available. Um, so I will be talking today about the National Resource Hub, um, part of our, uh, for helping to implement the national qualification system and beyond. So um, we can go to the next slide. So all of this um, at the National Integration Center, especially in, uh, in, in my, my particular section, the NIMS document and tool section, as the name would imply, you know, we are, uh, we, we put out guidance tools for, um, for, for implementing NIMS and explaining NIMS. So, you know, everything is based on, uh, that's kind of our, our, our Bible, right, it, it is NIMS. So, you know, you see here that the guiding principles, um, you know, that we are, you know, everything we do is tied to this, right? So you've got, you know, your flexibility, standardization, unity of effort, um, that's, uh, you know, those are it's kind of the, the very, the foundation for all of this stuff, um, you know, resource management on down to, to, you know, resources in general, and then down onto, you know, personnel management as well. Go to the next slide. So as I mentioned too, um, you know, there are, I, you know, it, familiar with NIMS, there are three different uh, major components to the document. Um, you know, there's uh, resource management, command and coordination and communications and information management, um, where we are working um, with the National Resource Hub, uh, in, in which space uh, we're working in and focusing on um, is the resource management space um, and particularly um, resource management preparedness. So we'll talk a little bit about that here shortly. Go to the next slide. So talking about resource management, um, you know, sometimes it's it's good to kind of define up front what we're talking about here. Again, talking about um, you know resource management preparedness, right? Versus you know the, the sort of the, the entire resource management cycle, right? So you see here as a graphic on the left, um, and this graphic is actually from a, 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 um, a supplemental NIMS guide that was released uh, earlier this summer, uh, just over a month ago. The um, the guideline for resource management preparedness. Um, and so this kind of talks about those four sort of steps or phases uh, in resource management. Um, and again, we will we'll talk more about this here shortly, but do want to show on this slide how it does, you know, it, it feeds directly into um, and supports response, right? So you see on the right, you have that resource management for, you know, for, for incident management, um, you know, these different, you know, uh, identifying requirements where to acquire, you know, mobilize, track, and demobilize. We are talking about everything, you know, over here in the, in the more colorful on, on the left. Um, the, the quad um, over the quad circle over there. So just want to kind of always like to say that up front, sort of what space we're talking about, particularly um, when defining this with you know resource management preparedness. Uh, next slide. Oops, sorry. Um, so again, uh, you know, a resource management strategy is again, you know, preparedness is the key word there, right? So you know, this is everything, you know. It, Kind of what the term we've been using and it's certainly not a term that we invented but you know everything left of boom right this is kind of the the, the field uh the the space that we're playing in with this national resource hub and really in a lot that we do um in the NIMS documents and tools section um so you know it allows those uh, organization providers to understand expectations of a resource you know what they've got um and it by its capabilities uh, allows those receiving uh, organizations or those requesters to receive you know something that's pre uh, pre-assembled predetermined that they know will meet the uh, minimum capabilities for their uh, for for their specific needs. Um, all this helps serve as a foundation for creating and then uh, creating and maintaining those uh, mission ready packages or, or MRPs 
um, and other sort of you know uh, force modules that uh, that folks may uh, may use as well. Um, and then uh, one uh, one kind of not really new concept, but you know something that a lot of times is is, is sometimes overlooked when we, we talk about you know talk about disasters thing like this is, is it's something also that can help you know our, our division is kind of helping to um, to integrate that resource management into day to day organizational operations, right? So uh, just the, the, of course, I think everybody's envision would be, and I mean, especially at FEMA, you know, our big vision would be, you know, it, making that national mutual aid process is it's just, um, you know, a seamless continue, continuation of what's going on, you know, day to day, um, you know, it's, it's every, you know, again, that's, that is a, is a big vision, but, you know, I think this goes, uh, this goes a long way. Um, a lot of the stuff, you know, that NAPS is doing and, we, and we've been doing with, you know, with the National Resource Hub over the years is, is I think is helping us get there. Um, so again, you know, I, I think it, it's not it's not bad to dream big. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have we start to talk a little bit now specifically about the National Resource Hub. Um, and we'll be talk, digging in here over the next few slides on this and you know, all that was kind of kind of to set up what, the space we're talking about with resource management, resource management preparedness. So uh, you see on the left here, um, this is this is the, uh, the the home the landing page. Um, within the uh, FEMA's uh, preparedness toolkit or, or prep toolkit, um, and it is it's a suite of uh, of web-based tools um, that support that resource management preparedness, right? Um, so they allow folks to use the uh, the you know resource typing definitions, position position qual sheets, and position task books. You know, so some of the guidance and tools that we've released as part of NIMS resource typing efforts and the national qualification system efforts as well. Uh, it allows you to uh, you know once you've typed those in, uh, resources to inventory resources and we define resources as we do in NIMS, you know, that's personnel, equipment, team, supplies, uh, and facilities. Um, specific to personnel, um, you can uh, manage uh, personnel's qualifications, certification, and credentialing um, to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, to, to train and, and credential your workforce. Um, and then also uh, it'll, uh, it supports, um, it supports everything, you know, that we put out, uh, you know, right, like all the, uh, you'll see on the National Resource Hub site and the landing hub, if, if you visit, it, it has a link to those, um, those those existed, or excuse me, those existing um, guidance, policies, practices, mutual aid, you know, that that exist out there already. Um, and you see here at the bottom, um, uh, there is the link uh, that'll get you to the um, the National Resource Hub. Um, I, I believe you can also Google, I think, Prep Toolkit, uh, and I think it's one of the first Google, uh, one of the first um, results that comes up as well. Um, and that will also provide you a link. But this here at the bottom is the direct link to the landing page. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to lay out at first to the basics, um, a lot of kind of what we learned um, with, uh, you know, doing these technology systems over the years, it's, it's, it's good to kind of get this out up front what it is. Um, so, you know, just as important on the left side, you see what it does. Um, I really want to talk, you know, about what it doesn't do, right? So to kind of, you know, make sure that we, we all have an understanding of expectations. Um, so what it does is, again, it ensures that those uh, organizations and it's specifically those resource owners, um, they, they maintain that full ownership and control over resources um, that information as well as the resource data. Um, what it does also is it consolidates um, what those tools that already exist out there um, for inventorying, typing, um, as well as managing personnel qualification and credentialing. So kind of making it a close as we can to a one-stop shop. Um, it does store information in a secure cloud hosted government authorized environment. So a couple of these tools that we'll be talking about um, uh, already exist in that environment, but some of them um, we are, or one of them we are bringing in to that cloud uh, cloud hosted environment, um, so you know exciting stuff, kind of bringing it um, bringing it in, making you know data a little bit uh, easier to share, um, and then also as always, it offers a no con uh, no cost solution no cost solution excuse me for um, for all state, local, tribal, territorial uh, government agencies as well as non governmental um, organizations as well. Um, so again, that's you know the big thing, um, kind of not not to bury the lead there, but it is a no cost um, solution. Um, you know, FEMA basically is, is paying the call it call it FEMA is paying the licensing fee basically for folks to use it. Um, so again, what it doesn't do is that organizations and especially those resource owners, they do not lose control uh, or ownership over the resources or that information or data. And again, say it over there is you know that it ensures that they do it, and we just like to reiterate that it's certainly um, you know organizations and resource owners. Um, control their resources as well as that the data um, on those uh, resources. Um, it is not a deployment system, um, so it does not support, you know, going back to that slide earlier, it does not support that instant management resource. It is all about resource management preparedness. So it does not support direct resource requests, deployments, or resource tracking. 
um, since it does not, it is not a deployment system. Again, it doesn't allow um, anyone to, you know, e either an agency or individual to to request or deploy through the system. Um, you know, so it, I, I know there's a lot of systems out there, but you know, with Pima's, you know, it, our it, like the deployment tracking system with Pima, it it does not have that ability to to again to you know port resource request or deploy folks. Um, and then of course, um, as with anything we do, it does not change or modify um, any existing mutual aid agreements or compacts that are out there. It's really just another tool to help, you know, to help bolster and strengthen those compacts and agreements. Next slide. So again, here we're going to dive in more into the resource management preparedness process. Um, so you know, we've got you see the four um, the four pieces here in this quad. Uh, you know, it's kind of a we'll kind of go through them in order here um, as you see it. But again, it is a continuous um, continuous you know a, a, a cycle, right? But um, so in acquiring, storing, and inventorying resources, um, you know, this is uh, for day-to-day -day operations as well as stockpiling, you know, resources for incidents. So you'll see that our solution in the National Resource Hub is the resource inventory system. When you move over to identifying and typing those resources, um, you know, that allows folks to have that common understanding um, of resources based on capabilities, um, that solution is the resource typing library tool or the RTLT. When you go down to qualifying, certifying, credentialing personnel, so you know using that uh, based, you know, helping to implement the national qualification system, that performance-based approach. Um, again, you know, uh, uh, allowing folks to demonstrate their uh, uh, their you know incident-related positions. Um, we have one responder um, that is out there, so that you know those all three are these two: the resource typing library tool as well as one responder. Um, you know, are already they they have they have been around for quite some time, especially RTLT. Uh, risk, uh, you may have you may be familiar with the incident resource um, inventory system, and, and the risk is uh, kind of the, that new cloud-based piece. And again, we'll be talking more specifically about that, but that is the one of the new kids on the block. And then finally, talking about planning for resources. Um, in here, here we kind of talk about um, you know allowing folks to you know identify, manage, estimate, allocate, order, um, and deploy and demobilize. So supporting this. Um, this is uh, what we have is, is, some, is it's not quite it's not developed yet, but we will touch lightly on it um, is a future development for, for data visualization um, for uh, for uh, jurisdictions, organizations to be able to, um, you know, we have all this data in the system so to put it to some use to be able to, to help with that planning. Next slide, please. So here uh, discussing, you know, in that last slide, we, we talked about the three tools. So this is kind of a very quick overview um, of uh, of the three tools that are already out there, um, or and actually yeah, as of now they are out there. Again, the risk is uh, you see number two there is, is new, but it is it is available. Um, so the resource typing library tool again, the RTLT, um, it's that centralized database um, that uh, that houses uh, templates. So it houses the resource typing definitions um, as well as the job title, position qualifications, and what's new um, as of uh, as of the summer, it also hosts the uh, position task book templates as well. For NQS, um, so it does serve as the foundation, um, the database for for risk, and, and now also for one responder. Um, and it is as has always been. It is publicly available. There is a publicly available um, API for third party systems to be able to consume that uh, that data feed from RTLT. Um, the risk again, the resource inventory system is now a centralized software tool that, um, as the name would imply, uh, allows folks to inventory um, individual resources. And we call it out here specifically as it also personnel. Um, so again, as of uh, as of just last month, there's the online version of RISC um, is available uh, by request. We'll talk a little about more about that here shortly. Um, and uh, version 2.0 of the RISC is in the uh, is in development and will be released in the new feature. And again, we'll be kind of talking about the where we're going with RISC here shortly. And then finally, is one responder, um, and it's been around um, for I think about, since 2017, so about four years or so now. Um, and it's the uh, it allows folks to um, it allows folks to manage personnel qualifications and, and credentialing, um, you know, in, in support of the national qualification system processes. So again, what's new um, as of this summer, as of last month, is it does now consume that RTLT API um, to allow uh, real-time alignment um, with the job title position qualifications, as well as the position task book. Uh, next slide, please. So here is kind of taking that, um, what we talked about a little bit here and showing the current architecture of what things look like um, as of today, as of as of the summer. Um, so you see the uh, the large uh, gray dotted line is that prep toolkit, uh, preparedness toolkit, um, authority to operate boundary. So this is um, you know all of these systems now um, exist within this boundary, 
in that centralized cloud hosted secure um, authorized environment. Um, so you see at the bottom, you have the resource typing library tool is that foundation. Um, and then it supports the, uh, the, the you know, that the feeds into the resource inventory system um, as well as the one responder. And then again, it also, you'll see here kind of grayed out to the left, we do have the legacy uh, IRIS, that incident resource inventory system, still available as a download of the software. And that as, as always that RTLP supports it. Uh, then finally, you see the blue dotted line that does go outside the, uh, the, the, the boundary. That is that API um, that we're working on that, that connects with third party systems. Um, so you kind of see those over on the right. Next slide, please. So here is a kind of very quick um, update, um, things that are new as of, again, very uh, you know, hot off the presses. Um, so we did release that, that first version of the, uh, the resource inventory system, part of the National Resource Hub. Um, you can see this piece here, the RIS, um, this is a direct link to that. Um, that earlier link was the direct link to the National Resource Hub as a whole. This is to that RIS piece. Um, that version one pilot that I talked about, um, it is underway uh, through the summer and into the fall. Um, it is available for uh, organizations that do not require multi-agency hierarchy, um, you know, such as uh, we provide the example here, like a, a parent-child hierarchy. Um, and then uh, uh, to, in order to do that, you can, in order to get the, uh, the access to this, this uh, you can, uh, there is an access request form. Um, and what we will do, the reason we, we ask for some information just so we can set up that scoping and orientation session with folks. Um, and then we review those requests um, and, and about how we can, you know, how, how, ensuring that we can get to folks, you know, within, within the current limits. Um, you know, as I mentioned here, this is a pilot, right? So what we are trying to do, uh, you see at the bottom bullet is, is an updated and improved version is really based on this pilot. So right now, again, it, it does not, um, it does not have that, uh, the, the ability in there to, um, for, for multi-agency as, as it does with IRIS now. And as you can do with, with one responder, you have partnerships things like that, but that is of course the vision, right? It is making this that. So, but again, this is the very first version. So we wanna scope out and make sure that we build it out um, to the community's needs. Um, again, the legacy um, Irish users will not be impacted. Um, however, uh, it, we are encouraging folks that, that may be using Iris now, to go ahead and uh, request, uh, put in that uh, access request form, begin transitioning to, to risk because eventually um, Iris will sunset that, that downloadable software. Um, as uh, as risk continues to roll out of mature. The next slide, please. So here you kind of see uh, again, kind of taking what I just talked about there, what it looks like um, in the uh, it, what what it what it looks like, yeah, you know, sort of now, and what it will uh, you know what what it looks like. Excuse me, what that legacy piece looks like, and then what it looks like now, right? So you see, you know, the uh, RTLP um, it, it within the uh, the the cloud hosted secure environment, and that APO boundary. Um, and you've got the legacy iris, uh, you know, either on a computer or on a local server um, down there outside of, uh, you know, outside of that um, boundary uh, with, with no direct connection there. Um, here you see now the RTLP uh, connects directly into that risk in that cloud host environment. And then again, that information still, you know, is connected and pushes, uh, you know, pushes out to those the, 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 um, um, folks, those third party users. Next slide, please. So um, I think we are, I think I am running a little bit behind, um, but uh, so I, I won't, I won't read all of this. Um, I, I do believe we are sharing these slides bundling up for everybody. So I, I won't read too much of this, but so you, you see here the um, sort of the capabilities um, that it does have, um, you know, again, centralized and secure, uh, you know, bring onto that cloud hosted environment um, where we're hoping to automate, you know, NIMS resource typing, um, you know, using RTLT. Um, you can also create local definitions um, and resource uh, types uh, inventory within the RIS. Um, and that'll also include a resource typing calculator. Um, so those folks that are familiar with the, the legacy IRIS, that, you know, that tool that's available in there will also be available in RIS. Um, and then uh, as we continue to go, it, you know, it'll have folks can, folks can have an inventory and manage, uh, manage their roles and permissions in there. Um, you see a link here as well in that left, bottom left, uh, the terms of use. Um, kind of talks a little bit about the uh, what the what the risks, um, how you could share and, and inventory information there. Um, so again, the limita limitations uh, right now. Again, this is these are limitations that we know about, and these are ones that we are working to overcome um, as we continue with the pilot and, and the it matures. So again, does not support relationships um, at the moment. That no hier hierarchical or um, or partnerships. Um, it's uh, it is kind of uh, time consuming at the moment because of the larger uh, you know for those larger multi-agency implementation it's it's not a, it's not an automatic type thing 
Um, right now, you can only um, uh, uh, export the data uh, in those uh, these formats here, the static data. Uh, you know, no no direct connection. Um, um, the information from the API. Um, you know, again, uh, working on that. Um, and then, uh, kind of minor limitation is that when you those folks that will be migrating from like a legacy iris into RIS, most but not all of those data fields will migrate over to bulk imports. So again, we, we tell you about these limitations, understanding they're there, but also you know almost that provides us you know it's it's, it's more of a it's a, it's an opportunity uh, and a challenge rather than an obstacle. So um, just you know letting letting folks know that we're calling that out up front, but we are working on it. Uh, next slide, please. So to gain access to the systems, um, this will be the uh, one of your uh, should be a good go-to slide for you when these come uh, these get sent out because these will be your um, your direct links. Um, again, you see the three links here um, in those in those sub bullets um, that'll take you to um, you know to the RTLP piece, which is a publicly available system. Um, the risk this will take you to the the, the the you know the landing page for the risk piece um, where you can uh, submit that access request form, um, and then the uh, the the link um, the final link down there. Is the personnel qualifications link for one responder? Excuse me, um, that can help you get uh, get into that system for uh, for managing um, your personnel qualifications. Um, I think Rebecca did answer the quest uh, the the questions because I think there I did see it kind of pop up on my screen. But so RIS and one responder do use that single sign on with Prep Toolkit, so you do not need separate accounts. Um, you know as you did uh, previously. This is again uh, new as of this summer. Um, so you only need that one set of credentials to log into the systems. But you will need an approved prep toolkit account um, before you can uh, before you can you can use RIS or one responder. And again, as always, um, and, and and continuing the resource typing library tool is publicly available. And I think that may be my last slide. That is it. Um, so I will turn it over now. I believe uh, Charlotte. I think I'm turning it back over to you. Is that correct for uh, to, to introduce Rebecca? Yes, yes. Thank you, Hank. Thank you for that great information. Yeah, with that, we're going to hand it over to Rebecca Harnett with Four Arrows Consulting to cover some upcoming developments and what's available to you for interoperability for incident management technology. Over to you, Rebecca. Great. Thank you so much, Charlotte. So I will try to keep this a little shorter than originally planned. But what we're going to talk now is a little bit more about the guidance. So going back to Charlotte's earlier message about the, you know, the foundation of how NAPSIG, you know, establishes and promulgates best pra practices. This is where we really talk about, you know, where the standards fit in and how do we create a, a more interoperable nation around incident management. So next slide. So the problem I think that we all know is that during an incident, speed is life. And the speed by which the right and accurate information is available to leaders and managers directly influences the outcome for survivals. The public safety community continues to experience challenges applying incident management technology, but what we're seeing is that it's not so much due to a lack of technology, there's so much technology out there. It's available by different vendors at different price points, but due to insufficient use of interoperability and information exchange standards, I think we all know it hinders that system to system data exchange when we need it and when we want it. Next slide. So the solution that we looked at from a guidance standpoint is how can we help leaders and managers inform the acquisition and selection of technology that applies the appropriate incident management information sharing standards, um, thereby serving as the basis for how we improve interoperability among the public safety community nationwide. And so the approach that we have elected to take to address this is to provide public safety leaders with a simple guide to map their decision-making needs to the appropriate information and sharing standards. And then also provide guidance for the technology and vendor community to use in implementing the standards within the relevant systems. Next slide. So, but first of all, why are standards important, right? Um, Fundamentally, leaders and managers can't assume that interoperability is inherent in the products being promoted by technology providers and vendors. 
but by ensuring interoperability, we increase the longevity of technology investment and overall sustainability. Since standards um, that we'll hear about in a few minutes from Elisa don't change very frequently. And so upgraded software technology does not need to be purchased as often. So there's obviously an inherent cost savings benefit uh, to ensuring that the right standards are applied to the technology. And fundamentally, standards provide that agreed upon data format that knowledgeable groups have vetted through series and years of community involved reviews and that they allow systems to speak easily to one another when we need them to. Next slide. So the guidance that NAPSIG has developed, um, the goal of it is to equip leaders and managers with the requisite knowledge to inform acquisition and selection of incident management technology that applies these information sharing standards. So there's a current version that's available today, and we'll provide the link to that in a few moments. Um, and that's really a combined version of that document. So it has the information needed for both public safety leaders and managers, as well as the technology vendor community. Um, and then what we have coming in about September of 2021 is we're actually breaking this guidance up into two pieces to make it more usable and accessible to the community. So there will be a shorter job aid focused on incident management technology acquisition and interoperability, and then a supporting technical guide that will dive deeper into the information sharing standards, how they apply and where they apply in incident management te technology to support the, the technologists and vendor community. Next slide. So I won't go into the specifics, but um, both of the guidance really breaks the issues down into two categories, situational awareness and resource management. Because what we learned from working with the community is that there are different sets of questions and information points that leaders and managers need to ask in these two areas. And as such, it's also a way to look at the difference of how we share information, need to share information, and then which standards apply. Next slide. So provided here is a quick uh, reference to the standards identified that are referenced in the guidance itself. Um, and this provides you with links to some of the authoritative information about those respective standards. I will mention that most of these standards are from the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, OASIS, Emergency Data Exchange Language, EDXL. There is also uh, one other standard that's included in here uh, that is part of the National Information Exchange Model. Next slide. So what does this all mean? And I think at first this graphic can be a little bit overwhelming, but if you break it down, um, what we did was we inside the guidance, there's actually a use case um, for a public safety scenario and it's based around a mass casualty incident. And which oftentimes in a mass casualty, as we all know, we rely upon response from multiple agencies and sometimes across multiple jurisdiction, which is what you see over here on the left hand side, you see responder system number one, number two, number three. And then you can see that data coming in from the field, moving into the, you know, what's oftentimes used as a compu computer aided dispatch system or a CAD system. And since you're talking about a multi-agency response, you need that sharing of information between those CAD systems, but also flowing seamlessly into your emergency operations center, which is the larger dark, darker box on the screen, which is kind of like the nucleus or you know, the hub information point where other third party um, information may need to come in either from private sources, such as you know, commercial power plants, uh, or hospitals or from other governmental systems such as your Department of Transportation because perhaps that incident impacted road closure information that needs to flow into the EOC as well as um, mass notifications that need to go out. Um, so you can see that uh, the different standards are referenced in here so you can understand which standards need to apply at which points in your agency and organization's technology framework. Next slide. But before you know, you really get into all of that, the first thing is ensuring that you've got a sound technology decision making process. Um, and really that is comprised of multiple processes that we have kind of spelled out here and you read this from you know, left to right. So 
you know, a sound process is going to start with good uh, requirements gathering uh, and definition that's going to help you form a system requirement specification document or otherwise known as an SRS. And both those requirements and that SRS really serve as the foundation for whatever your procurement and acquisition process is. Uh, and through that process, you're able to select uh, the technology that best addresses your requirements. You know, and from there, you go through the technology implementation process, which is also where the standards are really key. So, you know, that standards process really covers uh, the first, you know, five pieces that you see here as a part of that decision making flow. Next slide. So, in terms of where to start, right, because even that those numerous processes can seem a little bit daunting, but we've laid out inside the guidance some really clear steps to help you start assessing what for fundamentally your information sharing requirements. So it's really your information sharing requirements that help you determine which standards are most applicable to you and your agency's needs. So starting with determining your agency's need for information sharing, you don't need to share information that's not necessary, right? And determine how your systems would need to communicate to share that information, identifying what interoperability elements are most important, and then incorporating all that information into your system requirements and specifications. Next slide. So I won't go through all of this, but you know, it really comes down to ensuring that you ask yourself and your team the right questions. And you do that sort of introspection or self-assessment of your information needs, which really helps you drive at what standards are important so that you can convey that uh, to your technology, technology partners and vendors uh, prior to making a decision and selecting technology or determining upgrades needed to existing um, investments that you might have made in incident management technology. Next slide. So, in it, and I share this as well, because if you already have a system in place, um, you don't necessarily need to start from scratch and purchasing something new, right? But you can work with your team to answer some questions to understand to what degree your systems are interoperable and able to share the information you need um, it to, to be able to support your information needs in operational planning as well as in response. And it'll also help you identify gaps in information that you, you are needed and how to fill those gaps. Next slide. So, and then that kind of leads you into this process of asking your technology partners and vendors the right questions. Um, look at those technologists as partners in your mission, right? If they're updating an existing system or procuring a new one, that communication about your needs for information sharing, as well as the standards, needs to be a part of that dialogue. And the reason that this guidance is available is to equip you with what you need to be able to have those conversations. By no means are most uh, public safety leaders and decision makers already, you know, have that level of technology knowledge to be able to know that the ins and outs of it, nor do you need to. But there are some basics that can help you um, have the you know, better conversations with your partners. Next slide. Uh, and I'll just move to the next slide in the essence of time here. So applying the guidance, um, don't assume your technology partners and vendors are also up to speed on the latest interoperability standards for information sharing um, and incident management. Oftentimes the technology community comes out of, you know, the IT world, which isn't necessarily connected with, uh, you know, emergency management data exchange languages and information sharing standards. So that's really why this, the guidance that we're talking about today fills that gap. Next slide. So just a quick uh, link here so you can start using the guidance today. I know that Charlotte put it in the chat and placed a link in there. Um, and then uh, version three coming in September, we'll have that breakdown of the different pieces. Um, I will make mention, you know, in the guidance, it's really up to the agency having jurisdiction, what information they need to be able to share, even amongst their, you know, internally with their other uh, 
with their other agencies within their jurisdiction and, and externally. So, you know, that's certainly part of inherently part of the process and part of why we talked about, and I think it's the first step is determining what information you need to share. And, and that's really up to each individual agency having jurisdiction over that information. So just wanted to mention that because I'm seeing the uh, notes uh, in, in the chat and I appreciate all of that. So, so thank you all. And with that, I have the pleasure of handing this over to Elisa Jones with the OASIS Emergency Management Technical Committee to go deeper onto some of the standards I just mentioned. So Elisa, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, delighted to be here today. I'm going to try really hard to take a 20 minute presentation and, and do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> or less. <laughs> so I will have to rush through some things, but uh, thank you all for bearing with me and, uh, and listening up. So um, great to, to hear the work of NAPSIG, and I'm just so excited um, that uh, you do feature the OASIS standards, uh, given that uh, OASIS is the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards. That is the business we are on about, and I'm delighted to present to you about the emergency data exchange language and that suite of standards. Let's see if I can advance my slides now, that would be good. Okay, so agenda-wise, the things that we'll cover today, I'll give you just a little bit of an overview on OASIS. Some of you may not know what OASIS is about. Uh, then I'll follow that with uh, a definition of data interoperability, um, some of which we've already heard about, what the actual problem is. I'll talk about the common alerting protocol because of that detail, it'll help show you how this very simple but powerful data standard has literally changed the world with regard to alert and warning. I'll talk then about the basics of the EDXL. We'll flow through how it was conceived from the process um, of developing drafts through international standards. And then some thoughts about why EDXL should matter to you and uh, what you can do to get involved, uh, winding up with some references. So OASIS was founded in uh, 1993. It is a global international standards body. Um, it is uh, the home of 70 different technical committees, one of which is emergency management. And uh, we, were, we were founded uh, back in 2003. We started with the Partnership for Public Warning. Some of you may remember that formed right after 9-11. Actually, we had planned that meeting before 9-11 because there were some real problems with the way alerts and warnings were getting out in our old EBS and even the EAS system uh, for consistency. Technology was moving along very fast, but our ability to alert the public and the processes and policies that were followed prior to alerts uh, were very outdated given the technology that was available. So, as um, a member of the Board of Trustees for the Partnership for Public Warning, we had to choose which, um, what is the most appropriate response to this question, and we decided that uh, data standards would be the right way to approach the alert and warning problem. So we sought a standards body that we could work in. Now, it, we looked at uh, ISO and IEEE and all the others, and we chose OASIS because of the fact that it is uh, free. The standards, you can choose your technical committee to have no royalties or uh, IP that can be protected. Uh, it's also open in that any member of uh, the community worldwide can participate, and it's international. And we thought those were all very important parts of, uh, of why we should choose a standards body. So we did. We chose OASIS. And you see there some of the uh, situations with OASIS and the members and the continent, very, uh, a large number of members. We're also internationally recognized. We are one of the three top ICT consortia worldwide. We also have um, an association uh, with the, all of the EU's um, uh, ICT standardization. Uh, the two that I'll talk about in particular are HL7 and ITU. Uh, today because they have joint work that we have done that have come out of uh, the OASIS Emergency Management Technical Committee. And our process is ANSI accredited. That's important to know. Um, ANSI is an accrediting body for standards development processes. So the TC process is a very important part of what we do. Um, our members don't um, 
uh, just rubber stamp things. We have a very specific process we go through to develop the standards and also to take comments in and track every comment that comes in and how it's uh, dispensed of. So we have quite a process uh, and it does take a while. I believe it was Rebecca that mentioned earlier, these things don't happen quickly, but it's very meticulous and, and very uh, important work. Um, we have a tremendous set of volunteers that have uh, continued to work on this and, for, for years now. So just a few notes about the technical committee process. It enables our members to develop specifications and related deliverables for in an open process uh, that will wind up being an international standard, uh, but only after quite a bit of deliberation. We have uh, different IPR modes, as you see here, which is important, and that's de defined by each technical committee. So the Emergency Management Technical Committee has several subcommittees. I'll talk about those as I go through just a bit. But just uh, to, to go ahead then and talk about uh, how OASIS relates to other de jour standards bodies around the world, the Common Alerting Protocol, which is uh, out of our committee, is also an ITU recommendation 1303. The Tracking Emergency Patients and Hospital Availability Standards are also HL7 implementation guides and cross-paradigm implementation guides. I'll talk about these in just a bit, but it was important for us as emergency managers to have our work accepted by other important uh, standardized bodies around the world so that uh, it would lead to adoption and acceptance. So that was important to us. Now the data sharing challenge, um, we have ineffective communication uh, that really causes preparedness collaboration to be difficult. It slows our decision making and risk lives. Uh, emergency management, public health, and, and first responders really can't share data across the agencies as we need to to respond appropriately. Uh, most have disparate systems and technologies, and uh, some of this is uh, what I call stovepipe systems that are built on purpose, it seems sometimes, to not be able to share information. Uh, but this is also in part to the fact that uh, different systems and technologies are purchased at different times, different life cycles, and different budgets. So uh, voice interoperability has been improving, but data sharing really uh, must improve. So the family of EDXL standards does provide a common language or interface to allow that to happen. Uh, it'd be nice if we had one single system that could meet all the needs and everything was great and wonderful. That is uh, a pipe dream and won't ever happen. Instead, what happens is we wind up with these stovepipes where one system will talk to another through one interface and to another with another interface and another. And what happens is uh, uh, some companies make a whole lot of money and it really doesn't help the, the, uh, the different system implementers. But wouldn't it be a, a joy if we could have a data standard that each system could use to speak to another system such that it cuts down on the cost and, and the information can be shared in, in a way that can be effective to the response. CAP is uh, a very simple data standard. It has the ability to take all types of different uh, uh, hazard and threats, put the data in a very simple format, and then be able to be dispensed with many different types of dissemination tools. Uh, this is a very, very simple concept, but the ability to grasp this and put this really set the stage for so much of the work that we do now. Because not only can these sensor systems on the left be uh, made by different providers if you use a simple standard data format, but also the disseminations, the siren systems, the phone, the apps, the different dissemination methods can be provided by different uh, persons and those of you that make uh, decisions about what to purchase can then make informed decisions, making sure that the data is going to be available and provided in a standard way. Then you can make good decisions about uh, your technology providers. So CAP is used all over the world because of it being such a, a simple and formidable standard. It is used all over the world. More than 70% of the entire population live in a country that have a national level CAP feed. Uh, the, the ones in green are national level. Uh, the uh, yellow have uh, CAP developments underway, but they are not uh, a full national system. And the, uh, the ones in gray are just unknown. 
that's one of the things about our standards being free and open. We don't always know who are actually using them, so we don't know unless they tell us. But um, it is certainly a wide use. And I won't go into these slides, but I do list national systems, NGO and commercial systems, a number of weather alerting systems, and then also some sensor systems that emit ha uh, CAT messages. Um, uh, also CAT-based systems that are in like the Microsoft Citynix program. So CAT has been uh, wide ranging and reaching, and we've seen some tremendous benefits of the technology that is truly saving lives around the world. So what can we learn from that? Uh, there's a number of resources there I'll leave with you. But what we, what we determined, and, and this was happening in the days that DHS was first being stood up, and some of you remember that uh, preparedness was always a FEMA thing, but uh, folks at DHS saw preparedness as being a preparedness thing, and, and yes, it is all of that. But what happened was the science and technology group at DHS undertook this process to develop a practitioner steering group uh, to form this emergency data exchange language. Now the process that happened, we wanted to build on what we did with CAP. What, what happened and why CAP was so marvelous is we listened to the practitioners. We talked to emergency managers. We talked to people like uh, Don Maletti, rest his, his soul, what a wonderful man, so, but, but people that had uh, understood the psychology of what caused people to act. So we wanted to build on that good situation that we had with CAP for what is the next standard that needs to be developed. So the science and technology group under um, Dennis Gusty at the time started a process where we had, um, you see the red, the blue, and the green. We have industry, local, state, and federal government, as well as emergency and healthcare providers providing some really good input on the um, practitioner requirements. So what do we need? What standards are needed? So what this team did was look to see if there are existing standards that are out there. And if so, let's use them, let's adopt them, let's build on them. If they're not, let's draft new ones. So that's, that's what we did beginning back in 2003. And once a, the scenario team had access to the draft requirements, they developed the message specifications, and then we took that to the community of the Emergency Interoperability Consortium. And this was a group of not only local, state, and federal folks, but also product and service providers. Because what's the use of a standard if people won't build to it? So we, we ran it past this group of, uh, of uh, product and service providers. So after it was vendor reviewed, the requirements were handed off to OASIS. And within the process that I described to you, that TC process, we developed an international standard. Where it came to us, it was a very uh, US specific standard. Uh, we bounced us off uh, many of our international partners. We developed uh, testing and live exercises. And that made the standards available then for the public. So briefly, we have CAP, we have the distribution element, which is the wrapping and routing of structured and unstructured data. In my mind, you can see that as the on-ramp to FirstNet. In my opinion, the distribution element would be a tremendous um, opportunity to put digital data on the FirstNet backbone and have it wrapped and routed in a way that it's properly secured and properly made available only to those uh, entities that have uh, authorization to receive it or to send it. Uh, we have a set of uh, healthcare standards, tracking emergency patients and hospital availability that go hand in hand. We have the resource messaging uh, standard, which is actually a set of 16 different standards to request and response requests uh, to request for resources that are based on the, uh, the typing that you speak of. We also have the uh, shelter tracking emergency clients and shelters that we can track evacuees and, and shelter victims. And then last but not least, of course, is situation reporting. Each of these uh, XML data standards are developed in such a way that they can uh, directly map to any of, uh, of your ICS forms. So that is the full set, uh, just a quick mention of, of each of them here. Um, and then I want to just speak on the, uh, the healthcare uh, just a bit. We have the hospital availability and tracking emergency patients that we've worked closely with HL7 to finalize. Uh, many years ago, there was the HAVBED, it was a grant program where um, 
bed availability had to be posted in a particular format. That was a grant program in the U.S. that was discontinued, uh, but it did provide data in a format, which we, um, we uh, grew that to be the HAVE, H-A-V-E, Hospital Availability Exchange Standard, and it provides information for local and regional coordination. Um, HAVE is a joint work by, uh, with, OASIS, with OASIS and HL7, uh, because we need to be able to get the hospital uh, bed availability information and also facility information. So what, what good is it to have a respirator if your hospital doesn't have power? We utilize the HAVE standard, uh, both Google and Sahana and one other company used the HAVE 1.0 during the Haiti response to the Haiti earthquake. And we found that we did need to add some things like, for example, um, facility uh, support uh, so that we could uh, indeed, and also geographic support, we had that in there already, but we made a number of changes and now have 2.0 has all of that incorporated and it also works with the HL7. And HL7 has the ability to uh, um, implement its, on the output side, what beds are available so that a dispatch service can know where to take patients. So this is the idea here, you have an incident EMS encounters the patients and you collect data about the patient's needs. You know because of HAVE what uh, capacity is available at the different uh, uh, facilities. Uh, tracking emergency patients allows you a standard data format. So rather than use the old uh, plastic uh, triage cards to track patients, you have a real data format that can be automatically loaded into your EMS data. And then when you get to the hospital, your patients can be tracked and taken to whether it's a trauma or a burn unit, depending on their specific needs. All this can happen very readily and easily uh, using the data standards. So that's the purpose of these. And this transform is actually done. Tracking emergency patient standard on OASIS side is transformed to the HL7 ADT. That's the admit discharge and transfer message within HL7. Now that's a messaging format that HL7 uses within the hospital. It also, of course, can be very useful for evacuating a hospital. Uh, the same thing uh, would happen in reverse and that transform uh, supports that. Um, if uh, you have a situation that goes beyond uh, your, your hospital and your local area, the ability to tie into JPAT, uh, and this was actually tested uh, back in the day it was being developed. Now the, the TEP standard I mentioned, uh, this is the HL7 transform and it's a bi-directional. Um, I know I'm, I'm running way over, so I apologize. I just want to mention a couple more things. Um, the cross-domain juris jurisdiction automation can happen because of the data uh, formatting and uh, that, that we can have with standards. We can also eliminate much of the manual data entry by being able to use a data format. Um, we have uh, consistent interfaces among providers, which allows you as, uh, as uh, purchasers of products and services can uh, ensure that these can communicate by putting the required language in your RFPs. Certainly a force multiplier and resource optimizer. Um, we can leverage existing systems. And I want to say a few words about the international bit of this because international is, is a key. We, we know that disasters don't stop at the border. That's why CAP uh, was so important to be able to proliferate that standard throughout the world. It's also important as we know with the pandemic that we have are just trying to come out from under, had these standards really been adopted and in place, wouldn't it have helped us in such a tremendous way to, to get control of, uh, of the resources and the patients and the tracking. In fact, India has done, uh, at the CAP workshop last fall, India showed an amazing uh, use of CAP for tracking COVID patients and uh, relief efforts. It was uh, quite an amazing uh, presentation. A lot of great CAP presentations that have been done on COVID. I'd be happy to share with you if we have a little more time. So upcoming work, the uh, framework toolkit we're trying to get developed. Um, we certainly need some help. FEMA and DHS are members of OASIS, and any of you could very easily become involved with our work. We would love to have you. Um, we are working on right now an event terms list for committee note for CAP. Uh, the, the value here is that uh, 
there's different names all over the world for different events uh, that uh, require typing. And uh, these, these events are known differently, cyclone, hurricane, et cetera. We have to have a common list of terms. So we've developed this at the request of the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. Um, I should also mention, in addition to the ITU, the W World Meteorological Organization and others have been promoting CAP for quite some time. So uh, we do have a worldwide uh, community. We'll be working next on the Mobile Alerting Practices Guide because we find we have WIA in the United States, which is great. Um, there's a 3GPP specification that defines the cell broadcast nature of those mobile alerts, but we're finding around the world that they're implemented slightly different. So we're going to uh, develop a, a best practices guide that will help in the mobile alerting that will support not only the operators, but the alert originators, as well as the, uh, the communications commissions like our FCC. It turns out there's a lot of education that would be helpful in, uh, in these organizations around the world. Of course, promoting adoption is something that uh, we're on about, and uh, we have our annual CAP workshop. Uh, this year it'll be in Geneva again, but we had over 800 people last year uh, joining uh, via a Zoom webinar. There's a strategy project in Greece where all of the OASIS standards that I've mentioned have been developed and they're going to be doing some tabletop exercises. I think it would be so great to have uh, NAPSIG involved with some of the EU efforts regarding uh, information sharing. And I look forward to uh, pursuing that with, with you all. And I'm just gonna rush through the next two slides. Um, some of our guiding principles for our uh, framework toolkit I just listed here and then some resources. Uh, listing. So I do apologize for going late, but I'll stop with that now and see if uh, we have, I don't know that we have time for questions, but Charlotte, I'm, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. So we will jump back over to the other slides with just a handful of action items and wrap up steps. So once again, these slides will be provided to you. So you have these links, but we just wanted to encourage you to, to take some next actions based on what you heard today. Thank you for hanging on the line with us. Uh, so you will be able to explore the National Resource Hub. We've included a link to that. We encourage you to review and contribute to the resource management maturity study. So that has been ongoing. We have released a preliminary report of the study, but we're forming a baseline understanding of the extent of implementation of resource typing, inventorying, and management across the nation. So additional information contributed to that study will help give us a better picture and will be used to help inform uh, future guidance and technology investments that support NIMS and the National Qualification System. And it, uh, it's very useful. So thank you for any time that you can invest in that. Accessing the existing guidance, so that's version two that's available on our website of the information sharing standards that you heard about today. And then lastly, we wanted to highlight an upcoming webinar, again, hosted by NATSIG. Um, encourage you to register for that. It's August 4th and is a member innovations webinar um, that we will be partnering with some international partners for that one out of Trinidad and Tobago and uh, New Zealand and other places. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, uh, we've included some email addresses in the slide deck for you to reach out to us. And you're always welcome to reach out to us at, at admin at uh, publicsafetygis.org. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you. Bye.